This entitled family will give you a headache. You won't believe how badly they treat this family member and still expect to see them whenever they want. Happy birthday, today's your birthday and on with the revamped show. I work IT at my college, usually work in the back so I don't have to deal with people, but once a week I get to grace the help desk. My school gives its students a lot of privacy and they can decide what the school can release to other people when they come for orientation. It ranges from we're an open book to we can't verify the student's existence. This student selected we cannot verify his existence, which applies to everyone that is not an immediate family member. So be me, bored out of my skull, watching the minutes tick by of the last five minutes of my shift, ready to get dinner. I get a call from whom shall be known as Apache, very aggressive helicopter parent, hence attack helicopter. Thank you for calling my school. ITS help desk, how can I help you? Hello, my name is Apache and my son goes to the school but is having trouble logging in to our online panel for students. Can you give me his password? I'm sorry to hear you're having trouble, however we do not keep students passwords on record. However, if he's having issues with it, he can reset it online, call us or come down to the building we're in to come get it fixed. Okay, can I get it reset then? He really needs to get in. I'm sorry, but it has to be him who asked to get it reset. I can't do it for anyone else. But I'm his mother. I can get it reset for him. I'm sorry, but it has to be him who comes and gets it reset. It can't be anyone else, even his immediate family. But I'm his mother. I've done everything for him. I understand that, but college policy states that only the student can request a password reset. I'm his mother, you incompetent piece of crap. Give me his password. At this point, I know it's about to get fun. I look back at my manager, who is totally awesome and loves stuff like this, and signal to her to get on the line and listen. I understand your frustration. However, I can't go against college policy. I would recommend that you call your son and tell him to call us to get his password reset. No, you listen to me, you little crap. If you don't reset her son and person I knows. Password right now. I'm going to get you fired. Her son was one of those guys who lived in my floor and I knew, but wasn't really friends with. Okay, let me talk to my manager and see what I can do. I go back to my manager, who is already smiling about this lady, and I tell her I know this guy, and if it's alright to text him and let him know that his mum is on the phone, asking to change his password. Since it's about his account, she says go for it. Yo buddy, your mum is on the phone cursing me out because I won't change your password. Did you need it reset? What? No. I know my password. Why is she calling you? She's saying you forgot your password and is now going off the walls. I put her on hold and I'm sure she's steaming at this point. Wait, what's her name? Apache. <laughs> That's not even my mom. It's my stepmom. If you remember from the very beginning, this student had selected the I don't exist to the outside world privacy package. So now we could have even more fun with the attack helicopter parent back on the phone. Hello, Apache? Yes, what took you so long. Sorry, I was just looking over some information and I don't see you on our files anywhere being related to any of our students. So what? I just want my son's password. I'm sorry, but we have parents of our students on record and you're not on any of them. Student is my stepson. That's a son. I'm sorry, we can't release any information at all to anyone that's not an immediate family member. He goes to the school and I'm his mother. Give me his password. I'm sorry, I cannot verify students enrollment at our school. What the heck does that even mean you little crap? I'm gonna have you fired. At this point my manager is giving me the cut the call sign. So I just tell her I'm sorry I couldn't be more help. Thank you for calling the school. Have a nice rest of your day. Don't hang up on me you little click. It was now 5.04. Four minutes past the end of my shift. So I get up and leave. Apparently she called back five minutes later and went ballistic on one of the other nerds who works at the desk. Relatives like this would be such a hassle. The student in the story knew he had to intentionally sign up for the extra privacy package because his stepmom would probably do something like this. And you know what? She did. But imagine having to always look over your back because there's a relative that's trying to snoop in on your life. You can just tell that when he lived back at home, she must have been super controlling. Well, it's really good that the school had a policy like that. It's definitely a win when a busybody doesn't get their way. I used to volunteer at an animal shelter when I was in high school. Where I am from, shelters overflow and the 
adoption coordinators take in and give away dogs. Just a signature, no questions asked. Just to add, I love dogs more than life itself. This is especially why this story made me rage. Scotty was a big black lab, a seven year old gentle giant. All he would ever want from anyone would be a few pets, maybe a belly rub. I met him, the best dog I ever knew, in the worst circumstance possible. He was being abandoned by his family. Enter EM, EF and EK. EM, 40, almost tearfully claimed that there is no way they can keep Scotty anymore. EF, late 40s, has just gotten a job in Australia and the family must relocate. They have no financial means to take the dog. I was just a volunteer, so I saw as the shelter manager sighed as she processed him into the shelter. The dog has no idea what is happening to him. He just wagged his tail. The entitled family dropped him inside and suspiciously, without a tearful goodbye, left him at the door. Now, the shelters in my country are not like those you have in the West. They are basically a free for all, a big area in which dogs are just tied. Some roam loose, it's absolute hell. So we tried to love the dogs enough to make up for the lack of infrastructure. Now back to Scotty. It has been two days and he wouldn't budge from the spot that his family had left him. He would hear footsteps and wag his tail just to be disappointed. He wouldn't eat. He was the saddest dog I had ever seen. I would sit next to him and he would just put his head on my lap and sigh. I couldn't bear it. I took him home. It took him two weeks to become happy from depressed. He also had a ton of medical issues. His liver was giving out. I wondered why his ex-family hadn't told us he was this unwell. One day, the shelter got a call. It was the entitled family asking if they could visit Scotty. Red flag number one. They had to urgently relocate. Why hadn't they left yet? I told them politely that Scotty needs some time to get used to his new house. EM told me EK has been crying for him and wants to see him. I agreed. They came to my house to meet him. Scotty was ecstatic. He was almost ready to leave with EK. What was funny to me was the EM and EF sat in the car while EK went up to pet him and take pictures with him on his phone. He didn't seem emotional and spent about 10 minutes with the dog. This happened two or three times until I decided it was taking too much of a toll on Scotty. Every time they left, it started all over again. Scotty was sad, depressed, wouldn't eat. I promised myself I'd let him forget those people. They had now started calling me every other week and I asked them when they're going to Australia. When are you guys leaving though? That's none of your business. Well, Scotty's well-being and emotional state is my business, so I can't let you guys meet him again. He doesn't eat for a week after you guys leave. <laughs> what emotional state? He's just a dog. Listen to yourself. And you didn't even tell us he had a liver problem. It's just a dog. Can you calm the frick down? You are not allowed back in my home. Okay then, send the dog back to the shelter. That way EK can go see him now and then without it being such a hassle. Excuse me? This is his house now. Screw you! And she hangs up. So during this time, my dad was in palliative care at home for last stage lung cancer. The house was to be kept quiet to keep my dad comfortable. Scotty would always stand guard outside my dad's room. The doorbell starts ringing frantically. I go to open the door. In barges EK and EM. EM vomiting some rant about how it's her right to meet her dog and pushing the kid to go pet the dog. Scotty was right outside my dad's room who he had grown very protective of. Now this dog has never barked. He has whimpered at the most. He sees EK and EM charging towards my dad's room and barks so loud. EM and EK are taken aback. I almost cried out of pride for this boy. He knew who his family was, finally. He growled a little and settled back down in front of my dad's room. Not even a tail wag their way. They left and never returned. As of 2019, they've never gone to Australia. Pretty sure his liver ailments, which he passed away from a couple years later, made them think of him as too much of a liability. You can tell that the hero of the story really loves dogs and the job that they do. They obviously have a passion for it and has compassion on the ones that are mistreated, so much so that she adopted this one. It's heartwarming to see that the dog knew who its true family was at the end. I think unfortunately, we sometimes as humans make that mistake and we don't see that our real family are those around us that treat us with love and kindness. So my story starts on what was a normal day, taking calls on the front line for a large cable company. The job pays well, and for the most part, the people I deal with are fairly nice to talk to. Quite often, we'll get calls from seniors, especially in the morning, who have premise equipment issues, such as snow on screen or no signal on their TV sets, connected to our digital equipment. Now, my heart does go out to some of these folk, because up until recently, past few years, we would supply straight analog cable to many homes 
homes, coax direct from wall to TV with scrolling guide. However, most cities we service nowadays require our digital equipment to receive channels, and this has caused a lot of frustration with older people who don't know how to operate said equipment. That is to say, always having your TV set on video or HDMI to get picture. So oftentimes we get customers who are repeat offenders with long ticket histories of these types of issues. So anyway, I get a call from an older gentleman who's quite bitter and mean right off the bat. He doesn't like that I asked for his address, telephone number to verify the account, hates that he has to speak with a machine before reaching an agent, etc. I have some experience handling these types of customers, however, this call was going to be a little different. I spent over 45 minutes with this guy, we'll call him Mr. Smith, trying to get his TV set connected to the digital box properly so he could receive a picture. No luck. He was getting clearly frustrated by the whole ordeal and started blaming me for not being able to do my job properly, how I was useless, etc. Whatever. Like I said, I've dealt with this before, so I tried my best not to take it personally. But eventually, I had to ask him if we could book a service tech to the home, a courtesy call, to get his TV working correctly. Unfortunately, our booking calendar was showing an appointment three days out. That's when he dropped this on me. Don't bother sending a gosh darn technician, because I'll be dead by then. I'm 94, and TV is the only thing I have left. Are you really going to make me wait for a tech? I instantly felt bad. I mean, I've heard every complaint in the book as to why people don't want to wait for a tech, but this one kind of got me. I'm in my mid-twenties, so honestly, I can't even imagine how it must feel to utter those words. So I spoke with my supervisor, who said they'd see if we could get someone out earlier, but we couldn't promise anything. So I let Mr. Smith know, and he was predictably not very happy with my answer. At that point, it almost sounded like he started to cry, and went into how he has no family left, and no friends that come visit. This was after I asked if there was anyone in his building that might be able to help. Man, I felt terrible, so I took it upon myself to ask Mr. Smith if I could pay a visit. He lived in a small city over from where I was, not very far to drive. He was a little shocked I was willing to do this, but sounded thankful I was willing to come out and help him personally. So I head over, get to the residence and meet him. Within 30 seconds I had the cable running again, simple input change, and even brought him a simplified remote for his set top box to avoid this problem in the future. That's when he started crying. He goes into how he hasn't actually spoken or really interacted with anyone for years. He gave me a hug and told me how thankful he was that I came out and helped him, and told me how sorry he was for being so mean earlier on. I said it was no problem, and I was happy to help, and that was it. I left. Three weeks later, my supervisor comes to my desk and asks me if I could come speak with her for a bit about an account for Mr. Smith. Turns out, he sent the cable company a letter outlining how thankful he was for helping him with his issue, and how it really made an old man happy again for once in a very long time. The letter was framed and put on our front entrance to retail. I guess the moral of the story is, no matter how nasty someone is to you over the phone, sometimes they're not always a terrible person and just going through a lot. I still think about Mr. Smith occasionally when I get those nasty customers and it makes me feel a little better. I think some people act terribly because they've been treated terribly themselves and that never justifies their actions, but I think it's how they justify it to themselves. They kind of think, well the world sucks and it's been terrible to me, I don't really care about anyone else. And I think that's probably the philosophy of most entitled people. I don't think there's any simple solution to the terrible actions of these people. I think we all do terrible things. The problem lies a lot deeper in our hearts, but it is a wonderful thing when you can see an act of love melting that heart for just a moment. Submit your story to be read on the channel at voiceyhearstories at gmail.com and join our Voicey Veteran community at r slash voiceyhear. Don't forget to like, subscribe and hit that bell to never miss an episode. Alright Voicey Veterans, I'll see you in the next one.